a good webinar should have about 50 stories. That what? seems like a ton, okay. right? I'm going right. to break it down for you really okay. quick. If you've done a webinar or a stage presentation, this is why you want to use stories first. If I tell you, hey, Mike, um, you should really go on a diet. It'd be good if you lost some weight. Uh, I have this magic pill that you can take and you're going to lose weight. Right away, a wall goes up. Steve, what's up, dude? Hey, what coming is on. going on? Thanks for having <laughs> me, Mike. I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited. Well, it's just, it's whenever we talk, it's good. I was telling everybody, of course, that we were in a mastermind together and uh, we're, we're fellow wanderlusts. We're just absolutely. Um, of like, bonds, right? I mean, part of the, part of the fun of this game to me when I did it was when I left my corporate job, I was like, I am free to do whatever I want and go wherever I want. And it's, yep. I mean, over the last five years, I went from traveling like 30 days a year to traveling 250 days a year. <laughs> some people will say like that's crazy but that's what you want and that's what did you do in corporate before all of this um, so i was a fine dining manager uh got my start in chicago so i built a built a business in college sold it traveled for two years ended up as a bartender in chicago but since you know we're overachievers and we can't just you know work at a place um ended up running that place and then uh, Vail Corporation hired me and I went from being a dining room manager in their fine dining establishment to running, uh, overseeing their fine dining program, fine dining banquets, all their C-suite events. So any corporate event that would come in. Um, but that's what got me into events. I was like, I really enjoy mm -hmm. this space. Let's start holding live events. So that's what I did in 2015. Uh, kind of left that and moved to Vegas and started holding events. Well, yeah, I mean, you're, you're like the live event and virtual event, like King. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, obviously in the last year or so, the world, you know, has been what it is. The live events have kind of come to crawl. You then saw a lot of things happening in the market in the virtual event space. Um, but I want to talk on live events first, because you know, the, yeah. when we first met, that's what you were, were, uh, really doubling down on obviously for many reasons because so many people in this space are doing live events what 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 when someone a client contacts you and says steve help me with my live event what are they really asking you like when, when you hear that what do you hear oh man i mean i i got good at asking clarifying questions because people would reach out and they'd say i'm holding a live event can you help me well yes but to some people, it's filling the room. To some people, it's where do I hold it? How do I negotiate the space? How do I get other speakers in? To some people, it's, oh my goodness, I, I want to be on stage. I have this picture. Everyone's seen the Tony Robbins picture, right? Where he's like backlit and he's up there and he's got thousands of people. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're like, that's what I want to do. Well, okay. That's my best client is that person who has a course. So I did my whole goal with this when I, when I decided to do live events, I held my own live events where I would bring people in, we would bring in guest speakers, I would keynote and I would sell, I was the only person selling and I would sell marketing. Uh, I sold Facebook ads, I sold YouTube stuff, and then I sold just general marketing help, VIP days where I'd fly to their office, spend a week with them and help them implement fixes. All of that changed because I got sick of working with clients all the time, like mm -hmm. high maintenance clients flying all over doing Facebook ads. So I just started doing live events and I just wanted to focus on high ticket. I didn't want to build a course. I didn't want to do all the low ticket stuff. I was like, if I can get four or five people a year to pay me twenty-five to $50,000 to help them build a rock star live event that does a million dollars back end, mm. I'll be happy, they'll be happy. The world will be a great place. And that's what I did for about two years until COVID hit. So when people ask me, to circle back to your question, when people would contact me and say, oh my goodness, somebody gave me a referral, I would ask some questions. But usually I met them at a live event. If I was at a mastermind or a live event or a meetup and I got to know the person, I said, hey, this is what I do. 
usually I had an idea of they have a course, they have a coaching program, but they don't have a live event yet. Because to put on a good live event is you're going to spend a minimum, a minimum of 20,000. Yes. So, I have been there. <laughs> I mean, you do. Okay. Yeah. Go, go. So, I was going to say, so my, masterminds, but go ahead. Yeah. 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 So, uh, so my live events have always been smaller because mm-hmm. I, I, I've been around live events in a, in a previous life. Like I was around, li- I've worked at a church. I was mm-hmm. basically three live events a week. And then I did conferences, you know, and I, I mean, outside of a wedding planner, uh, I was doing a, more events than any typical person. Uh, and I was doing music, video, audio, performance, all the speaking. I knew, I know all about putting on a live event, except when I went into the business space, which is where you were, you know, situated. I didn't understand the, the part about backend upsells or selling to the, from the stage or making an offer at the event that will, you know, basically make the events. Uh, an even bigger win. Mm-hmm. So when I started out in my career, you know, I had courses. I was I was probably your ideal client. I wish I knew you back then because you probably would have helped me a lot more, right? I had courses. I had mastermind groups. Those people would naturally come to my event because they wanted to meet face to face. So it was kind of a community thing. But I really didn't have a, a a concrete strategy for how that event and the people there would funnel into more programs or more offers or even do even just the next stinking live event. I'm like that. I didn't think about that that much. Mm-hmm. Um, now I do workshops and I don't sell a lot on the back end of a workshop because the workshop is just, you know, it is what it is. <clears throat> and I've never wanted to do a two or 300 person or more live event. Cause there's so much involved, so many logistics. When you see someone like who I was two or three years ago, what do you tell them? Do you tell them go small, go big, or like what's your word of advice there? So I actually, if I'm if we're doing a Zoom meeting, I put up the mm-hmm. picture of Tony Robbins and I'm like, is this what you're picturing? And then I have a big red X that <laughs> and I'm like, okay, let's I just want to do some math with you because I went through this in my own business. When I first started, I was like, I went to Treasure Island, I rent space for 1,400 people because I was like, I'm gonna do this. Well, I failed miserably. But what I ended up, I had to cancel that event. My next event was 100 people, which went really well. I made money. I did not sell from the back because I hadn't learned that yet. Very similar to like, that's where a lot of, I went through the learning curve that a lot of people go through. Like, well, why do you want to hold a live event? Well, I want to be on stage. I want to have people. I want to impact. Why do you want to hold a live event? Because you want to make money. Like that's not your only purpose, but you have to get clients. You have to have a, like, if you are not charging your clients money, you can't change their lives. They can't work with you in a long-term environment. The point of a live event is your best, your best would-be clients will be there. They were willing to get on a plane. They were willing to travel. They were willing to pay the expense to be in a room with you to learn from you. They will pay the money because they want the outcome that you, that they think you offer. So if you put the right outcome in front of them, you will like, we've all sold courses. 10% of people who buy courses complete them and get any kind of outcome. But when people come to a live event, the people that buy there, 50% of those people get an outcome because you can work with them. They're a different class of client. Um, so that's where we start. And then I tell them, if you've never held a live event before, hold something that is 20 to 40 people because that is a manageable size. You're not going to lose your mind. And what I found in my own, so I went from that 100 person event to a 250 person event to an 800 person event. But what I found was, although the cost goes up, the close rate actually goes down so your expenses go up. My expense to hold the 100-person event was about 25K, marketing all of it in, right? My cost to hold the 800-person event was over 450 because I had to spend, 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 spend to get people in the room. My closing rate fell. So 100 people in the room, I didn't close anything. 
But what I found was when I held a 50 person event, I could close somewhere between 20 to 30 people on a reasonably high ticket offer. That was like the sweet spot. So that's where I tell people to start. If you have a course and you have a mailing list, if you have a list of 5,000 people and you have a course, you have some people who have bought some kind of low ticket, mid ticket item from you, we can put 30 or 40 people in a room and you will sell 15 to 20 of them on a high ticket back end. And that like, it's a 20K to somebody who has that kind of business going is not an undue expense, right? It's not, it's not $300,000. It's not $400,000. Um, it's an amount that they can afford and it will get them the result and really springboard them. And then you can grow the event slowly over time. I mean, honestly, I, I'm, I'm guessing some of your people listen, know who Russell is, know about click funnels. Mm -hmm. If you look mm -hmm. at funnel hacking live 1.0, he had less than a hundred people in the room. Is that it was right? Held, I didn't know that. Oh yeah. It was, you okay. can find the recordings. It was called ignite at the time. It wasn't called funnel hacking live. It was called ignite. You can find the recordings and it's like, it's a small room at probably a Hilton hotel in downtown Boise. Nothing fancy. They didn't have big, crazy backgrounds. He had one banner on stage that he paid a hundred bucks to have printed. I mean, that's where you start. And the thing is that the, those are your ideal people. That's what you want. Um, you touched on stage closing. That's probably the biggest thing that I help people with because they don't understand that it's so different from anything they've done before. I know you do a lot of speaking. You're very well spoken and you understand that process. But that's the biggest thing I think as well. Okay, we're going to hold a live event. We're going to put your right people in the room. Let me show you. I've done more than, I've, I've held more than 40 of my own live events. I've spoke on more than 80 live stages. There is a very good process it's like a story arc that you have to take people mm -hmm. through to sell that high ticket item. And that is always an eye opener to them as well. Cause I don't know, you've seen, I'm sure you've been to live events that make no sense. One speaker is up and then the very next speaker contradicts what that guy says. They don't make any sense. And like, they're just like scatter plotted all over the place. That's yep. that does not lead to a 50% room close rate. Um, right before COVID hit, the last event that I helped with, um, we had 40, 47 people in the room, I think. And we closed over 60% of the room on a high ticket offer. Um, it was amazing. The event right before that, it was uh, the third event that I had worked with for people following this exact process. We had grown from their first event was 75 people. The last event was 450 and they did over 1.8 top line at the event the lady sitting next to me like was ready to she was crying like it was the wow. she was just like overwhelmed with how well the process had evolved and worked so that's those are the stories that i tell people those that's what i walk people through for a live event just for the sake of those listening when you say a high ticket event what does that mean in your mind because i think we all have different ideas of that but is there kind of a general rule that you follow sure um so the event to cost to get in the door needs to be at least 497. If you're okay. not if you're not charging at least that much, now you can discount it. You can do an early bird, but like base price 497, you want people that are willing to pay to be in the room because again, these are your best people. If you do it at $10, you're going to sell a lot more tickets, but you're going your show up rates can be less, right? Mm -hmm. Um mm -hmm. the other thing that you could do is sell a course with the live event as a supplement. So if you sell a $1,000 course, sell the live event as a supplement, make them pay a seat deposit or materials deposit, something to get them there. Um, sure. Make sure they show. That aside, the other thing that high ticket means is your goal at the end of the event is to sell something that is at least $10,000. I like to see 15 to 25,000. Wow. Okay. Because you want, and it's usually a year long coaching program that is mm -hmm. for the people that want to take massive action. So I help mm -hmm. outline that program. Sometimes people have it together. Sometimes they don't, but if they have a course already, we have the outcome. We just need to re outline how you get that outcome for people, how you hold them by the hand and get them there. Yeah. And I've seen you do that, like reverse engineer it. And where it's like, Hey, um, Mike, this is what everyone experiences in your year long mastermind. Let's let's rework this from the back end, 
you know, work backwards. Um, I think that's the other thing too, with a live event, it's like, you're there, there's obviously a different energy. You know, you're in the room with people, uh, you're feeling, you know, the energy there. Um, you, you much more pick up on the vibe of the person presenting or your people are going to pick up on your vibe a lot more. And I, I think there's a lot to be said about people just want to be around you. Like we, we kind of overcomplicate. I think the offer obviously is super important. Um, everything you're saying is super important, but then there are a lot of folks who are listening in are like, I, I could never do that. I could never, you know, I know Steve's great, but he could never help me. And I just want to like interject here and say like, Hey, if you're doing a good job serving people and they've been willing to get on a plane to come and see you, um, they probably just want to hang out with you more and your program is a way to do that and help them get massive results. So, um, okay. All that said, you made mention, you did this for a couple of years with some really big ticket, um, people and clients COVID happens. You saw what was happening. We, we were actually at a conference together right before probably a month before the whole world went on lockdown and, um, you've transitioned into the webinar space, which you also kill it at because you can do all these things really well. What, for someone who um, may not see the connection between a live event and a webinar, are there some parallels that you draw to, to these folks? Like, for, okay, sorry, reframe the question. There are some people who kick butt on stage, a physical stage. You mm -hmm. tell them to do a webinar, they're like, what? <laughs> like, the struggle is real, right? Because they don't have a live audience. There, you know, what are some things that you kind of coach your clients through when they're making that transition from live stage to webinar or from webinar to live stage? Sure. So, I mean, I love speaking on stage because you get the crowd energy to your point. Like you stand up there, you are affecting people and people's lives are changing in front of you because you start, they get the goal sales, Zig Ziglar said this, and it's something that I tell a lot of people, sales is not getting people to pay you money. It is the transference of emotion. Hmm. It is the transference of changing that person's life. You believe in something so much that you are helping them take action. You're becoming an assistant buyer. Um, so that's what you're doing on stage. Now for people who are looking at a webinar, when COVID happened, um, I, at first I was like, this is going to blow over. I literally bought an ice cream machine and bought some video games. Cause I was like, you know what? I'm just going to sit back and chill. Like <laughs> I literally went and bought an ice cream machine. I don't know what I was so thinking. I thought, thought it was going to be like a month. Mm -hmm. Well, so six weeks later I wake up, I had to refund more than more than six figures out of my bank account with people that had paid for live events. Um, because my whole schedule was full for the year. Um, I sat there and I was like, well, okay, what can I do? And I can do like general business consulting because that's what I did before and I enjoyed it. But then I had a live event client who reached out to me and said, hey, you helped me with my live event. Can you help me put together one of these webinar things? So we took what we did with the live event and how do you get people engaged? How do you get people to show up in a state that they are ready to learn and they're excited to move forward? How can we reverse engineer that into the webinar space? And you can, because at the end of the day, it's speaking. You just have to do it the correct way. So part of it, if we look at that story arc that I was talking about, where are people at? Well, at a live event, your first speaker, you wanna meet them where they are. What's their biggest pain point? Well, in a webinar, you can kind of do that, but it works better if you actually run the webinar as kind of like a product launch series, put pieces out that meet people in their pain point and get them to move forward with you just a little bit, trying to future pace them. These could be videos. These could be emails. These could be zoom calls. You don't, this is the other thing that I'll say about webinars. A lot of people are like, Oh, I need to have 300 people register for my webinar. If you do a good job of getting people to your webinar, and you have pre-framed them correctly. We had somebody that I work with last week had 15 people on our webinar and closed six of them on a $2,000 offer. So she didn't spend a lot of money on Facebook ads. She 
did her email list and she did the outreach correctly to get people on. Now, I'm not saying every webinar works like that. It's great if you can put 100 people on and you have 50 show up and you close 20 of them. That's a good turnout as well. But I'm the I think that's what people see when they think webinar and they're like, oh, I've got to spend five grand on Facebook ads anymore to get people there. So the, go ahead. You So pre-framing the webinar, you mean like once someone signs up, that time from when they register to the actual webinar time, you're sending out content that meets them where they're at. I would say even before they sign up, if okay. you... If you have them on your list in your Facebook group, something like that, start putting out pieces that using NLP or pre-framing, <laughs> you want to, all you want to do is get them to future pace themselves just a little bit and be like, I want, I want what he has, right? Mm -hmm. um, I want that outcome. If you get them to say that before they put their email address in and register for the event, they will show up. The reason that show up rates have fallen off. So, I mean, yes, we're all busy. We all have stuff going on, but how many people are stuck in their house right now? Tons. So why aren't people showing up? Well, people aren't showing up because if they see a Facebook ad, it's passive advertising, right? It grabs their attention for that second. They register for the event, but then the event comes around, let's say three days later, and they don't remember what they registered for. Exactly true. Yes. I've done that many times. So if it's the other way, if, if you get people to lean in a little bit to the point where they're thinking about it and then you pop up again with an email or message in a Facebook group or even a direct message because we can see who interacts with what, right? Mm. You send out an email, a bunch of people click, send them a direct message. Hey, I noticed uh, you were interested in my webinar program. Uh, I'm going to be doing a training. It's going to be for 10 to 15 people. There's no cost for the training, but because it's smaller, I want to make sure that you show up. That's a webinar. I think re, reframing what a webinar is. A webinar is just a virtual presentation done over either Zoom or some kind of digital, right? Mm -hmm. That's all it is, is a virtual presentation. I mean, I've, I've been working with some people in the financial industry and their webinars are horrible. Like they're so dry <laughs> and so yeah. boring but they're, they don't know any better. They don't even come from our space. Right. And I'm like, I can make a few small tweaks with them. They're used to doing presentations to three to five people though. So that, that space works really well. Um, I know we're kind of bouncing all over, but that's pre-framing people. Can you hear that? I'm really sorry. My neighbor's car alarm's going off. Nope. Okay, good. Nope. Um, pre-framing pre people before they opt in is where you're, that's what changes your show up rate more than anything. Yes, you can send texts, you can do some other little things. You can have an on-demand webinar. One of the biggest questions I've gotten uh, over the past couple of weeks has been, hey, can we turn this evergreen? Hey, can I just shoot this webinar? And yes, you can, you should have an evergreen. Once you do the webinar, you should turn it evergreen, but don't stop doing the live training. Because that's where you get better at your presentation skills and you get to make the tweaks that lead to better response. If you want to be lazy, sure, but you're not going to have nearly as good of conversion. Yeah, I, I, I love what you said about the number of webinar registrants. Um, I don't know if I've actually shared this on the podcast before. I know I've shared it in coaching groups that I run. One, in my early days, I ran a webinar and I was testing different webinar times. Mm -hmm. And I, I lived on the East Coast for most of my life. And you know how East Coast, we East Coast people are, you're out in Phoenix. We think the whole world revolves around New York time, right? We do. And it sort of does just because it's New York, <laughs> right? And all the finance and stuff is there. And so I was testing out webinar times. I did 8 p.m. Eastern. I tried 1 p.m. Eastern. Those worked really well. And just for kicks, I tried it at 11 a.m. Eastern once, right? Bad idea. Okay, just everyone, I'm talking bad idea. Right. If you live in the U.S. and you're looking for U.S. customers, because now that's 8 a.m. Pacific. But I tried it anyways. I had two people show up to my webinar, whereas in the other other time slots, I had a couple hundred. So I was like, oh, man, what am I going to do? I just delivered it as if there were 200 people on the webinar, you know, and I still closed one person and it was a twelve hundred dollar product. So I was like, well, that's not bad, you know, 50 mm percent -hmm. sales conversion rate spent an hour doing this webinar and made 1200 bucks. 
Um, not bad. So I, I love that you you say that because I'd rather be in a room of, honestly, I'd rather be in a room of 15 people where 12 of them are going to buy than 300 and have to like mark down the price and et cetera, et cetera. So, okay. So you're talking about getting people on the webinar. I love that. I, I need to do a better job of that. Preframing webinars. Um, they get on the webinar. Is there anything that you can help us walk through? I know you've talked about story arcs a couple of times. Mm -hmm. Is that woven into the presentation or is that just in the close? How do you, how do you see all that? Sure. So, okay. A good webinar should have about 50 stories. That what? seems like a ton, okay. right? I'm going to break right. it down for you really okay. quick. If you've done a webinar or a stage presentation, this is why you want to use stories first. If I tell you, hey, Mike, um, you should really go on a diet. It'd be good if you lost some weight. Uh, I have this magic pill that you can take and you're going to lose weight. Right away, a wall goes up. And you start to, even if you want the outcome, because who doesn't want to lose 10 pounds really easily, but immediately you say, oh, it doesn't work because our brain is wired to immediately disprove anything that pushes onto us. It's a protective shield that evolution has taught us. A story does not trigger that. Hmm. So if I tell you instead about how I found in passing, I found this magic pill, I took it, and within three days, I lost 12 pounds. Your first question is, where do I get that? Did it really work for you? Were you doing anything else? But the presupposition is, I lost weight, and you want that outcome. So presupposition is a really strong word. It means that you cannot argue with something. This is, a, this is one of the best things in the world. Like this is just, this is a little bonus tip. All right. <laughs> if you ever say something along the lines of, hang on, I gotta, I gotta like think about this one. If you use the words notice, right? The key word is notice. Did you notice that webinars make people a lot of money? The presupposition there you are not going to argue with, and that is webinars make people a lot of money. Like anytime you use the word notice, it almost 95% of the time makes whatever follows it is an implant that they will accept as truth. You can use that in good or bad. That's a little side note. We'll just break that out. <laughs> um, that stuff. So yeah. for stories, 50 stories, the stories, the main stories, so when, I, when we reverse engineer a stage presentation or a webinar, what we do is we look at first, what's the stack? What's the offer? Everything in that stack, the main piece needs at least one leading story that goes up front that tells why they would need it, provides the context for it. And then you need three testimonials. Well, testimonials are stories, they're client stories. So there's four stories. Each item in the stack needs a leading story and at least one testimonial under that. So if you have a stack with one main and five underneath, right there, you're at 14 stories, okay? So gotcha. those stories. Then once we have the stack done, you don't need the stories right now. You can put them there though. Then each one of your bullet points, whether you have three, four or five bullets, most that's what most webinars or stage presentations fall into. Each one of those needs the same. It needs a leading story. Why? How did you learn or earn what you're teaching in this bullet point? Then it needs the teaching part. Inside of the teaching part, Russell calls them um, kind of like stories. They've been referred to as a lot of different things, but basically they're just similes, right? Mm -hmm. You want to take whatever you're telling somebody as a complex thing and break it into something that they would easily understand, right? So it's kind of like stock mm -hmm. traders making money, right? Something that they would immediately see. Those are little stories. You want to have probably at least one or two of those in your teaching. Bonus points, if those stories tie to something that's in your stack, you can then reference back to it, right? So when you're talking about easily making money, it's just like the day trader 
that I talked about earlier that makes money overnight by knowing how to trade right? This it's kind of like, yeah, it's kind of like the date. Yeah, that's a great phrase. Yep. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So inside of your bullets, you have the leading story. You have two kind of like stories, and then you want to have at least five testimonials or movie stories. So this is something that nobody else talks about. If you can't come up with a story, if you don't have enough client testimonials, talk about a movie that everybody knows and likes. It is really easy in our space to talk about marketing and use The Wolf of Wall Street. That's like the easy go-to movie because it covers everything. It covers like literally the gamut of everything we do in marketing. So you can point to some story in there Leonardo made a ton of money being dis, being unethical. You don't want to be like that. But it, it immediately gets people to picture. The point of the story is mm -hmm. to get people to picture the outcome that they want or want to avoid. So if you have three bullets, right there for each bullet, we have six stories. So if you have three, that's 18 right there before we've mm -hmm. done anything. Um, then you want your hero's journey story. So the, the key here is each one of your bullets, the stories need to connect to something in your stack and pre-frame your stack. The more, if I look at somebody's webinar or stage presentation and people are not staying till the end, if people are leaving the room at a live event or if on a webinar, if you have 100 people register, 50 show up and five make it to the pitch, I know your stories suck. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that's what gets yeah. people excited. They can't stop listening. So then the, the last piece is the hero's journey that goes at the front. I wouldn't call it the last piece. There's two more. The hero's mm -hmm. journey that goes at the front. Hero's journey story is usually the longest story and it has bits and pieces of all of the other stories tied into it. Now we're building this backwards. So when you start up here, you might pre-frame making money while you sleep. Then you might talk about a stock trader that sets a stock trade and goes to bed. And then in the close, you might say, you know, just like that stock trader that can make money overnight, that's what I'm showing you how to do. You have basically inceptionized people <laughs> from the start yeah, all the way through. So the hero's journey story is at the front. It's the longest. Um, you are going to have kind of like stories woven into that. And you're also going to seed all the other stories. The last piece is the very front end of your webinar, you want to have at least three to five testimonial stories that overcome the early objections. So when we look at the end and we look at the stack, we know what the objections are. That's what the testimonials are there to overcome. You want to soften those testimonials or other testimonials and overcome objections within the first three minutes of the webinar by showing people whatever the opposite of their objection is. So I don't have time to do this. I don't have money to do this are the biggest ones, right? Mm -hmm. If you can put that at the very front, people will lean in because they'll be like, I didn't think that was possible. This guy's really going to show me something new and exciting. So those are, that's where all the stories go. They all follow a pretty simple template, which is 50% pain. You want to hit pain point, pain point, pain point. Pain points should align with what people are feeling. Then you want a little sliver, about 10% to be the light bulb moment that change things. The, the light bulb moment should always tie to what you are selling. Don't give it away 100%, but, be, but when you get to the end, everything in your stack should tie to all those light bulb moments. And the last piece is the exciting tomorrow. How did it pre-frame people to get people excited? What, what was your life like after the big change? And it should be the outcomes that they want. If they want to own a boat and a private home and fly around the world, you should talk about that stuff. If it's financial freedom, talk about that. Whatever it is, that's what goes into those exciting tomorrows and they should be specific moments and examples. Brilliant. Okay, dude. <laughs> so this is again, see Steve, he's taking a drink, a coffee, sip of coffee here because that was a uh, high octane fuel. Okay, dude, um, how can, I just want you to review every webinar pitch deck that I've created now. Um, no, but in all honesty, like there, there's a lot to that because I tell stories. You know, I am a, I'm, I'm a copy guy, copywriter, blah blah blah. Um, but I wanna, I want all of us who are listening or watching to understand, like, 
you know, you never arrive at mastery. There are always, you know, things that we're learning from. Steve and I bounce ideas off each other all the time. And also the, 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 the landscape is changing. The market is changing. I mean, people are so easily distractible. I used to start webinars, you know, four or five years ago, completely different than I do now. Because if I don't hook a story in the beginning, they're just gone, yeah. you know, uh, especially in the marketing space. If I'm in other like kind of blue ocean industries where they're not like those financial planners, you said, where their audiences are not as attuned to webinars, there's not a webinar fatigue. Um, you can get away with you know, kind of yesterday's tactics, but stay on the cutting edge more and more and more. It's just, it's storytelling. I love what you said about <clears throat> the stories uh, having to be, uh, you know, woven through and it's kind of like, yeah, there you go, right? I'm using, and I'm just sharing this with you. I heard uh, an author say years ago, I never forgot this. Um, she said, as soon as people stop highlighting in your book, they stop reading. I never forgot that. She said that, um, gosh, I heard that maybe eight years ago. Mm -hmm. And when I was writing my book, uh, you know, for those of you uh, don't know, Steve's kind of been with me through this whole process. Um, we were in a mastermind together when I wrote my first chapter. And now here we are talking the books off in editing as we speak. Um, my second pass through my own manuscript before I sent it to the editor was let me go into my file of one liners and quotes because I had accumulated that over several years and I just mm -hmm. started to pepper them in. So I know as the author, there are going to be key takeaways in almost every section of the book. And what I'm hearing you say now with these webinars is that as the webinar creator, if you know these stories are there, you can rest assured your content is going to land with people. So that, I love that. So Dude, Correct. steal that. It's kind of like what I heard my friends say. <laughs> People stop reading as soon as they stop highlighting. And that's, man, so good, right? That is so exactly, that is exactly it. The, one of the questions I'm going to touch on, because you, you brought it up a little bit. Webinars used to be 90 minutes to two hours. And one of the questions I get now is, how long should a webinar be? Well, I have two answers and they, they tie together. The first answer is you should get through to your pitch within 40 minutes. If you're not starting your pitch within 40 minutes, you're, you're going to lose people. The something that will buck the trend, you're not going to agree with it most likely, but I want you to think really hard about it. It's not about the content that is in your webinar. It is about them believing no liking and trusting you and believing that you can get them to where they want to go. I want you to re-listen to what I just said. It's about getting them to know, like, and trust you and believe that you can get them to where they want to go. Us as the creator, nine times out of 10, believe that that relies on how much content we teach them. Mm -hmm. I want you to think for just a moment. I want you to go back to high school. I want you to think of the best teacher that you had in high school, your favorite teacher. Now I want you to think about all the other teachers. All the other teachers most likely taught a ton of crap that you would get in their class. You would sit down, they would start teaching. They would hammer you with knowledge. Did you enjoy that? No, you probably fell asleep. The person that you liked as a high school teacher, chances are they were highly engaging. They were funny. They made sure to talk to you as a person. Sure, they still taught stuff. They had the same amount of knowledge, but they probably taught less and engaged more. That's what a webinar needs to do. And you do that through story. You can, you can teach, if you try to cram 10 hours worth of learning into a 40 minute webinar, you will lose your audience because you are at a level eight, nine or 10, especially because you've prepared for the webinar, they're at a level two. Give them one big thing that moves them forward and three stories around that mm. and you will convert more. So, so good. the other thing on length of a webinar, this is something, this is, this is an aha moment for a lot of people. Light bulb's gonna go on. As long as you have people that are still live on your webinar, you should still be talking. They are fence sitters. As soon as you, let's say you start your pitch at 40, 41 minutes, 
the link to where they can buy or the button to buy comes up at 60 minutes, let's say. If you still have people on at minute 80, they're still listening. They want to buy. You just have not overcome the specific objection or convinced them. Keep talking. Keep overcoming objections. Keep talking about client testimonials. Keep talking about results that you've gotten for people mm -hmm. and they will eventually buy or leave. You've lost nothing except another 10 minutes, but you will gain sales. So it's not about how long the webinar is. It's about when you start your pitch, how engaging you are. Those are the two things that will, if you're super engaging and you start your pitch at the right time, you will get more sales. End of story. Does that mean, <clears throat> does that mean, okay, I have a friend who, who kind of does this, okay? Uh, I've never really understood it, but it sort of makes sense now that you're saying what you're saying. Does that mean you keep talking until no one's left on the webinar? Or you do that? I mean, I don't, I will say that I've stopped when there's like two or three people left. Okay. But what I might do is if it gets down to that, Hey Joe, I see you're still hanging out here. Is there a question that you have? Mm, okay. Like, I mean, you can actually, the, one of the brilliant things about zoom webinars is there's a chat box. They can raise their hand, but if they're still listening, like, I mean, think about that. Think about that from your buying perspective. If I'm watching mm -hmm. and I haven't turned it off, <laughs> why am I still watching? Because there's something there. I see some kind of value. So, I mean, I mean, Jason Faladin, um, what he does is he sits there and he literally starts, he has a list of 900 objections and he just lists, keeps listing objections that he's overcoming and keeps talking about client results. Cause he has, I mean, he has thousands of testimonials. So he'll just sit there and go back and forth between the two. I mean, at some point, yes, you're going to stop. But a lot of people, I feel like they're rushing to get through the yeah. webinar. That last slide comes up and they're like, okay, bye. Yeah. Well, yeah. I've been there. I yeah. mean, just keep talking. If you've got, if you have a hundred people on, you have no business ending that webinar. Like you should still be talking. Mm -hmm. If it grinds down to a handful of people, yeah. then okay end it. But if you have a lot of people, let's say you have, let's say you have 30 people that start and you have 25 people make it to the pitch because you did a good job with stories and you have 20 still on, keep talking because it's a high percentage and they're obviously getting value. Mm. No, I'd love that. Um, I'll close this with uh, two thoughts. Actually, what you're saying about the high school English or the high school teacher thing is Totally true, because uh, there's only one teacher I remember from high school. That was my English teacher. And I remember one thing he taught me, but he was just hilarious. I just, like, he, he taught me, um, and I, I share this a lot when I teach copywriting. Um, he taught me never assume uh, your reader has read the source material. So when I write sales pages, I assume that that person knows nothing about this product. So all of that's in there. But his name was Mr. Crawford. He looked like Santa Claus on Prozac. He often said that he had hilarious off-color jokes that he'd probably get fired for, you know, in this day and age. But back in the 90s, it was fine. And um, to your point about content, very recently over the last, you know, nine months to a year, uh, I have a friend, Daniela Nika. And uh, Daniela, her tribe is in Romania, you know, wow. where they speak Romanian. Not a lot. Well, they speak English, but, you know, Romania is their main language. And she's like, hey, I want to translate two of your courses into Romanian. Can we do some webinars? Can you do some webinars? Now, bro, that splits my content time in half because I've got to wait for the translation. So I'm saying something, then she or one of her team is translating. So my content is cut in half. And I'm not going to do a three-hour webinar. I mean, we're still right. doing 90 minutes. So now I've got 45 minutes for the content and the pitch all together because you know the translation is mm -hmm. doubling the time and that's when i realized dude i more and more and more and more and more content is not the answer it's uh, make them understand why we're teaming up together what our friendship is what our partnership is what the outcomes are who i've helped in the united states how i can help it's all that stuff so i totally am raising my hand and say you know what i've never thought about it that way and i think that high school teacher analogy is brilliant um that's how i'm going to be framing my content 
uh, yeah. from now on. It's about that connection. So dude, yo, where can people find out more about you? I know anyone who has half a brain is like, oh, I need to talk to Steve. Uh, where can they go? Sure. <laughs> uh, Stephen Philip Werner is my website. Um, S T E V E N P H I L L I P W E R N E R.com. Um, that will get you to my website. My offerings are up there. You can also connect with me on Facebook. I have a public profile. Feel free to send me a message. I do a couple of different things. Um, the first thing is if you have a webinar running and you would like me to audit it, I will sit down. I will watch the video in real time and film a Loom video where I watch it and pause it and give you direct feedback on what needs fixed. So if good. you have not built a webinar yet or you would like to build one, um, I do a done with you service. I don't believe in done for use for webinars because it's such a personalized, like it really is. It would be like, I'll give you yeah. like, oh, I'll just build it for you. Well, it's gonna come across as inauthentic, but I will build it with you. Those are the two things that I do currently. Um, I'd love to work with you, love to hear from you. If there's something I can do to help you out in any way, uh, please reach out. Happy to have a conversation. Killer, bro. All right, brother. Thank you so much for joining us today. Awesome. Thanks for having me, man.